Good evening, everyone. So we're about to get started. All right, welcome. Uh, my name is Jessica Thomas. I'm the editor of Physics. We're sort of a virtual magazine uh, for the APS journals, PRL, Physical Review X, and Physical Review. Um, we, we write about or have experts write about a selection of papers each week uh, in those journals. Uh, for those of you who know the website, uh, we'll be rolling out a new version uh, in the next couple of months. It'll have new navigation features and it'll be more mobile friendly than what we have now. Uh, also, uh, I wanted to say that uh, if you do get our email alerts, you'll get uh, tonight's talk uh, soon. And if you don't already get them, it's really easy to sign up. Uh, but you could also, um, we've been scanning badges and everybody who's had their badge scanned will be sending you uh, tonight's talk. So um, one of the things that we really try to do with physics is bring attention to uh, research that is crosses between different subfields of physics and crosses into fields even outside of physics. And I think that tonight's speaker, Sharon Glatzer, really uh, embodies that approach to research. Uh, she is in five different departments at the University of Michigan, which I think is a sort of rare distinction. And her work uh, is, uh, intersects between uh, physics and engineering, chemistry, mathematics, and biology. Uh, recently, she's focused on using computer simulations to study uh, uh, the different ways that nanoparticles can come together and form new types of materials and how that, those new structures depend on the nanoparticles' size and shape. And I think it's a really exciting time to be doing that because nanotechnology is at this point where uh, you can really tailor make nanoparticles for this, um, this type of new structure. Uh, we've covered some of her stuff in physics. Uh, she's done some, worked on some really neat problems, um, optimization problems, like looking at how uh, the best way to fill particles in a space, which turns out to be really useful in computer graphics. And she's also looked at the notoriously difficult uh, packing density problem and looked at how that depends on different, uh, differently shaped nanoparticles, which is, of course, important in industry when you want to think about how you have to uh, economically pack together pills or cereals. But tonight, what she's going to talk about definitely is more AI in tone. Um, and she's going to tell us about uh, the prospects for using colloids to make machines like you might find in a robot. So without delay, Sharon. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm um, delighted to be here. And, uh, and I'm very appreciative of all of you um, coming here to share your, your Wednesday evening um, with me. Uh, I wanted to talk about some, some new work that, that, that we're doing and um, just beginning to, to start to think about next generation uh, materials. And I want to start out, because I'll probably run out of time at the end, in, 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 um, in mentioning the students who do all the work. So uh, Jessica very nicely pointed out the work that I've been doing and by me, she means of course my group, my students, postdocs and research scientists in the group who do everything. Um, and tonight I'm going to um, show you uh, work that was done by, um, by a number of people, um, some of whom are here. Pablo Damasino is here, um, and, uh, and Matthew Spellings is here, Paul Dodd, Chasm Edmund, Michael Engel is here, uh, um, David Greer, um, and Dave Pine from NYU, Eric Jankowski, Daphne Klotza, my colleague Nick Kotoff at the University of Michigan, um, Carolyn uh, Phillips, who maybe still here? Is she still here? Um, uh, Stefano Sakana, Ben Schultz, Ayusha, and my colleague Mike Solomon um, at the University of Michigan. Um, all of us working together to try to do theory modeling, simulation, and experiment to make new, new kinds of, of materials. So civilizations are, are defined by uh, the materials that are available to them. If you, know, you look back from the Stone Age, to the, to the Bronze Age, to the, to the Iron Age, to the age of plastics, and now we could argue that we're in the, in the Silicon Age, um, our ability to master materials, what's happening? This is still on, right? Um, our ability to master the, variable, the, the, the materials that are available to us and use them in new and novel ways defines the world that we live in. It defines us as a society and what we're able to, um, to accomplish as a, as a society. So what materials will define our civilization tomorrow? 
in 20 years, in 40 years. The graduate students working, uh, sitting here in the audience, um, this is you, right? What, what, what is going to define your society uh, 40 years from now? Is it gonna be materials that we find around us? Or is it gonna be materials that we design and make specifically for, um, for target applications? Can I come on in? <laughs> so what I wanna talk about tonight is what kind of new physics do we need to start to think about making some of these materials? So what kind of materials are we, uh, am, I, am I talking about? So we're all familiar with Terminator 2, the T-1000, which is made of liquid metal. Um, okay, so, um, so if, we, um, if you think about what we just saw, right, um, there's gotta be something more than, something, than, a, than a liquid metal that is able to come together, to self-organize in that way, to morph itself into some sort of a, of a coherent form and carry out function, okay? Now let's look at a more recent um, clip. How many of you have seen Big Hero 6? That's it? Oh my God, it won an Oscar for, for uh, best, best animated film, right? It's fantastic. Okay, well I'm gonna spoil it for you right now. Okay, so here's a clip at the kind of material technology that is envisioned in this movie. Whoops, sorry. Okay, so think about the technology here. Now, what was envisioned in this movie are little microbots that are, that are uh, programmed to interact and, and respond to someone's brain waves. Um, and organize themselves into different things, but you also saw a lot of stuff going on, self-replication, um, uh, um, you know, pr production of, of, of more and more microbots, taking material from the environment and turning it into something else. So you may not have realized it, but there, are, there were a number of talks at this meeting um, and still to come at this meeting in sessions called uh, uh, self-replication, um, and evolution of materials, programmable materials, that are just starting at the beginning of getting towards something like that. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit. So, but this, okay, this is science fiction right now. It sounds a, a little far out. But here's something that's also science fiction that could actually um, possibly be a little bit more attainable. So this is from Aeon Plus 2005. That's me, 2005. Okay, so that's a little bit uh, uh, less AI and more about materials that bring together the, um, the physics of, of, of swarming um, and, and the physics of reconfigurability, self-assembly. Now, there's some recent work I wanna point out by um, Michael Dickey's group at NC State. They do beautiful, beautiful work. They have um, recently come up with a, a, a way of using low voltages to deposit and remove surface oxide from gallium-based um, liquid alloys. And by tuning the voltage, they can tune the surface tension um, by, uh, by several orders of magnitude. And in doing so, they can get their liquid metal to morph inside of, a, of, of an electric field. Um, and again, when you, when you, you look at, their, at, at their, um, their motivation, they're again trying to come up with materials that can morph. But these are liquid metals. They're not smart materials. They, they, um, they, they can't process information. They're, they're, they're not something that's pro programmable. But here, there's something that is programmable. So if you read Science Magazine in, um, in uh, the, the December issue of, at the end of this last year, they had the 20 top scientific discoveries of the year. And the, and the runner up for number one um, advance of the year uh, are these kilobots from um, a, a group at Harvard, and I'm gonna show you clips from their movie. Um, so these are little kilobots. This is work by Michael Rubenstein, not the polymer Michael Rubenstein, that's here. Alejandro Cornejo um, in Radhika Nagpal's lab in the, in the Vise laboratory. And what you're seeing, I'll, I'm gonna play this again. So these are little kilobots. Each kilobot's like basically like this big, okay? 
and and they they made a thousand of them. And then it's just a it's a it's a um, you know a piece of electronics that's highly programmable. Each one is 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 programmed with rules to interact with others around them. They um, each one has a label. They know if this one is zero, and if they touch, then this one is labeled one. Another one is labeled two. They have instructions for how to build edges. Um, and, and how to do things, but they, but they don't know necessarily what is the whole pattern. So the whole idea is, is, is um, programmable assembly through local rules um, to self-assemble into arbitrary shapes like this. And so by changing the program, they can change it, they can get the same kilobots to organize into different um, kinds of shapes. So, okay, this is, so this was the runner-up to, to science's uh, top discovery of um, scientific discovery of the year. And this is really the state of the art of micro robotics in terms of self-assembling, self-reconfigure robotics. I want to do this with nanoparticles. So what I'm thinking of, I'm, I'm calling colloidal robotics, OK? A, a robot comprised of micron or submicron size, meaning or nanoparticles. Um, if we do that, then the physics that we need to think about um, will involve statistical thermodynamics. Um, it'll involve programmable self-assembly and disassembly, nanoscale forces. Um, in all of these systems, in all of these science fiction movies that we were just looking at, there's got to be some sort of a power source. How are these materials powering themselves to respond and morph and, and, and carry out functions? So we have to think about dissipation and entropy production. And these are things that we're just beginning um, to, to figure out even how to ask the questions um, in, in terms of dissipation and entropy production. But so this sounds a little far out to think about how we might use colloids in this way. But there have been extraordinary advances in, in the synthesis um, and, and fabrication of colloids and nanoparticles over the past decade um, that suggest that colloidal systems with the characteristics that we might associate with little robotic robots or machines could actually um, be something that we could we could we could see um, in in the next decade or so so what would be some key characteristics if we really wanted to have robotic matter well the first thing is that they have to be able to sense and respond right so in all of those examples they had environmental awareness. The materials had environmental awareness and were responding to cues from the environment. They have to be able to move, locomotion. Okay. They have to have some sort of intelligence. There has to be a way of, and, and by intelligence I don't necessarily mean artificial intelligence in, in, in the sense um, that we might think of it typically, um, or and I don't mean some sort of sentient intelligence. I mean that there has to be some kind of programmability that is smart enough for the system to carry out the, the, um, the functions that, that we intend it to do. Um, and there has to be some sort of energy. Um, we have to think about how the system is going to get energy. How are these, what is the power source for these materials? Um, how, what is the process of actuation of turning energy into motion? So these are, the, these are really the, the key characteristics of, of robots in general. And I think that these would also have to be the key characteristics of, of if we think of colloidal robotic matter. <clears throat> so when we think about how we might design nanoparticles to, to do, what, do what we're talking about here, um, they'd have to be modular. We'd have to be able to think of materials where um, identical units or sets of units self-organize into a larger entity um, using self-assembly. This could be um, thermodynamic equilibrium type self-assembly in certain cases, but in most cases it may be um, materials that are driven far from equilibrium that organize into patterns by virtue of the fact that they're far from equilibrium, that they're able to um, take in energy, dissipate energy, um, um, produce entropy in order to stay at these far from equilibrium organized um, structures in order to form subsequent um, hierarchical levels of order. Because if we think about the kinds of, of functions that we want them to carry out, we, if, we, if we look to biology, we see that in biology, um, 
there are many, many levels of order. The order is, is hierarchical in that sense, and that enables biological systems to carry out function. Okay, programmable via local rules. We talked about that. How can we encode um, information into what the um, collection of nanoparticles wants to self-assemble into um, by controlling, say, the shapes of the particles or the interactions between the particles. So I'll also show you some examples of that. Um, we want our materials to be reconfigurable among multiple states, right? They have to be able to switch between, say, fluid and solid or a solid with different mechanical properties or different rheological properties, um, different um, optical properties. Uh, so that will be attached to the structure of the, of the material. So we need to be able to control that. And this idea of compartmentalization, if you think about the way that living cells function, um, they're encapsulated within membranes that allows them to, to partition um, the parts of the system from other parts of the system. So it allows for chemical gradients, they contain functional elements that can sense and transduce chemical and physical signals and that, uh, chemical signals and that allows communication between cells. So compartment, compartmentalization, the ability to, to sequester parts of your system on the nano or micro scale um, in, in different ways, I think will be critical to making these kinds of, of, of robotic matter. So what kind of physics is needed? Um, we need to understand self-assembly. We need to understand disassembly and, and, and how to make systems that can not just assemble into something and, and disassemble, but can assemble into one thing and then reconfigure to another structure and go back and forth, maybe sit right on a, on a knife's edge at a, for, in a bistable configuration so a tiny change in a control parameter can force the system from one structure to another back again with a very, very small input um, of energy. Um, we need to understand local energy storage and, and conversion. How can we take in uh, sound waves or, or light or, or uh, infrared um, and turn it into, um, in, into some sort of, of, of motion? Um, high local information storage and compute. I mentioned that I think these materials are going to have to have the ability to store locally information. If we look at the kilobots example, these are electronic um, little machines that have um, the information programmed into, into them with their local rules. How in the world are we going to do that with nanoparticles? Okay, and so I'm going to show you how one of the ways that we are thinking about how to do that. Active, persistent, controllable behavior. There are so many um, uh, sessions at this meeting this week on active matter, which is one of the hottest growing areas of soft matter physics, which is all about um, systems driven far from, from equilibrium and, and, and uh, using energy dissipation to, um, to uh, exhibit physical behavior that you just can't have in thermodynamic equilibrium. Self-replication, I mentioned. Um, if you want, so, so ideally, you would have materials that can actually self-replicate, that can grow more of, of each other. There was a beautiful invited session um, organized by, by Pablo Damasino that was held yesterday? Was it yesterday morning? Um, on self-replication. We heard beautiful talks by Paul Chaikin and Michael Brenner and Steve Whitelam and uh, Chris Adami. Um, and somebody else, I'm blanking on right now, um, on self-replication in colloids, and so I'll, I'll mention that, and self-evolving. Self so one of the things you'd like is um, if you self-replicate and you're always creating the same thing over and over again, um, that's fine, but how can you improve, right? So biology uses evolution for that. How can you build that into, the, into your colloidal material. And so there's some ideas there that the um, Chaikin's group at NYU um, has been looking at for actually evolving uh, little DNA microtiles. Okay, so let me show you some examples of some first tiny steps in thinking about how we can achieve some of this with colloids. So I'm going to show four examples. So let me start out with these colloidal uh, muscles. So these are... Um, Colloidal particles, 
their, um, their little plastic particles about a micron across and a, and a few microns long. Um, they're, they're Janus particles in that they're, they're, say, PMMA with one half of it coated with gold. These are synthesized by my colleague Mike Solomon uh, across the hall at the, at the University of Michigan. Um, and they can make many, many of these ellipsoidal Janus particles. These Janus particles um, are examples of a much broader class of particles that you may see many talks on here at the, at the APS meeting over the last several years, um, uh, where uh, one of the, the big advances in uh, nanoparticle and colloid synthesis has been to make particles of arbitrary shape coated with different sorts of materials, functionalized in different ways with different kinds of materials, so that the particles become patchy so that the particles are anisotropic. And because they're anisotropic, how they want to organize relative to the other particles around them can be controlled um, by controlling that anisotropy. And then that propagates itself into long-range order in the system. And so these Janus ellipsoids are just one example of a, cl of a class of, of, of patchy particles. And so what Mike and his student Ayush Shah did was they threw these, um, these microparticles in, into toluene, and they, they self-assembled into um, different kinds of structures. I do have a, oh, I have a, I have a thing right here. There's a little red dot. Um, they self-assemble into different kinds of structures um, depending on the, the thermodynamic parameters, the screening length. So these particles are, are charged. There are Van der Waals interactions between, between the gold. Um, and so depending on the, 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 the situation, they either just stay as free particles, they form clusters, they, they come together in these fibers that are disordered, or they make these long ordered fibers. Um, and what's cool about these, these fibers, so here's an example of what, what this ordered fiber phase um, looks like, and this is looking at it through confocal microscopy, through the two different channels, so you have the red channel and the green channel. The green is, is showing you the gold, and you see the way that these, they make these, these braids. And this is a computer simulation that was done by uh, my former student, uh, Ben Schultz, this is a, a molecular dynamics computer simulation of Mike's ellipsoidal Janus particles showing how these fibers form, that they form in these little bundles of four particles, and the bundles hook up to other bundles and, and, and other bundles. And, and, and the, the reason that they're, that they're doing this is that the, the, basically the gold parts are effectively attracted to each other, um, but because of their shape, the, the way to maximize the contact of the gold and minimize the free energy in the system is to have, I can't quite do this, is to have two come together and another two come together and another two so that they have as much gold-gold contact um, as they can. It's difficult to do this if they're not ellipsoidal. And then what's, what's really neat about these is that by turning on and off an AC electric field, which creates dipoles in the gold coating on these Janus particles. Um, let me make this go again. The, you see that the chain is extending and contracting and extending and contracting. And, it, and, and there's a simulation next to it just showing um, um, how, how this works. When we put um, fluctuating dipoles into our computer model, um, and you get a chain length elongation of about, of about 36%. So this is one of the first examples that I'm aware of of a, of a, of a reconfigurable, um, self-assembled colloidal structure. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it's basically undergoing um, actuation. So now, one of the things that we're trying to do is if you think about the way that, that muscles work and you have bun bundles of, of, of muscle fibers that, that um, that pull together these uh, these sarcomeres and these inside these mic these inside these myofibrils. Um, if we could sequester these long colloidal fibers and align them and then encase them in some sort of a a, a gelatinous sack, if you will, then maybe we can start to actuate a material. Of course, these are micron-sized colloids; these are very small. But it's the first step towards trying to get a material that you know, microscopically is undergoing some sort of, of, a, of a reconfiguration of the type that could change the elastic properties, affect the elastic properties, change the mechanical properties, change the optical properties of the material. Okay, let me give you another example of, of a system where, um, where we're, we're looking at to try to um, carry out uh, energy transduction. So this is uh, work that was done by, um, 
by my colleague Nick Kotoff and, and, and his students, um, where, of course, the, um, we started getting these emails about engineers create bionic particles inspired by the Terminator. Um, so what Nick did was, um, so, so first we did some work where so, um, Nick makes these little CAD telluride, CAD selenide nanoparticles. They're much smaller than Mike Solomon's particles. They're about one and a half nanometers on, on an edge, and they're, they're coated in, um, in some sort of a, of a ligand, which can be positively charged or negatively charged. The CAD telluride, CAD selenide particles are typically, um, they're grown in solution, and they typically grow in a faceted way to give you these little tetrahedra with, with some truncated um, corners. And one of the things that he, so he had a new student, and the student made a batch of these nanoparticles. But it's sitting having, having the usual size polydispersity of 5, 7, 8 percent. This had a, his, the batch that the student made had a size distribution of, with 25 percent polydispersity. So, it was a, so, you know, normally they would throw that away. But the student said, well, I'll use it. Let's see what happens. And what happened was that these particles self-assembled into spheres, each one with about 300 nanoparticles in them, each sphere exactly the same size as every sphere. And in fact, the spheres, and so this is a picture of, of what one of the spheres looks like. They're colored just to show the outer particles and the, and the inner particles. Um, and what's in the background is a micrograph, a TEM image, showing um, uh, that the particles, the super particles that self-assembled in solution, are so regular that they themselves crystallize into an FCC crystal, okay? Um, and so what's, what was exciting about that is it's one of the first demonstrations of a self-limited self-assembly of, of nanoparticles. And what's going on in that system is that the nanoparticles are, are, um, have Van der Waals interactions between them, which makes them want to clump together, but they're also similarly charged, which would normally make them repel. So there's a competition. Van der Waals pulls them together, the charge is pushing them apart. What happens as they start to come together is the, the Coulomb interaction between the particles becomes screened. And so another particle coming out from the outside, coming onto a cluster that's growing, feels less and less and less of an attraction. And so these things end up being self-limiting. And you can see that because they all come out in, in, into the same size. Um, What's cool is, is Nick was able to then show, so we showed with computer simulations that this is a very generic type of situation, should work for all kinds of materials, and indeed it does. It works for CAD selenide, lead, lead, uh, sulfide, lead selenide, um, and even uh, gold nanoparticles. Um, and the polydispersity was actually helpful in this case. It's actually self-organized within these clusters in order to contribute to this self-limiting behavior which is a little counterintuitive, but sometimes polydispersity can actually help self-assembly and not hinder self-assembly. Okay, so the next thing that, that Nick did is he said, well, what if, I, what if I take out half of the nanoparticles and throw in cytochrome C proteins? Cytochrome C proteins um, are, are you know, small enzymes that are, um, that, that are important in photosynthesis because they transport electrons, and they happen to be about the same size as the CAD telluride particles, and they're similarly charged. So he threw all the nanoparticles and the cytochrome C proteins together to see what they'd do. And in fact, they self-assembled, completely mixed, into the same kinds of super particles with a few hundred nanoparticles and proteins inside of these um, super particles. And so here's a, an image that shows um, uh, the DMAET CAD telluride Particle. So, okay, so here's one of these big super particles, and this is, a, this is one of the particles, then this is a blow up, and then this is a blow up of that. And if you um, look inside of one of these super particles, so this is a TEM image where um, the gold is showing you, the gold color is where the semiconducting nanoparticles are, and wherever you see black, that's where the organic you know, matter is, that's where the proteins are. And what you notice about this is it's completely continuous. So it's a completely mixed up, heterogeneous, um, or I should say hom homogeneous mixture of these proteins and these um, nanoparticles. So what's important about that is that by integrating the um, biological matter with, with um, 
semiconducting material, we can now bring together two very different kinds of functioning materials to do something new. And so what, what Nick was able to show is that these superparticles can carry out photoenzymatic activity. So basically he, he added to these particles, in addition to the cytochrome C and the CAD telluride nanoparticles, enzyme nitrate reductase and, and NADPH um, to get a photocatalytic reaction. So basically you shine line in these superparticles and the CAD telluride particles produce um, an electron. They absorb a photon, produce an electron. The cytochrome C carries the electron, carries out um, a, 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 a chemical reaction um, um, to, uh, and, and so you could get this charge transport. And so what they're able to show is that you, you, you create a hybrid structure that's hierarchically arranged that can carry out, that brings together the functions of both and you don't lose the functions of, of, of either. So perhaps this would be a way of making tiny little energy sources that can take in light and produce electrons and carry out local reactions if you could imagine compartmentalizing them in, in large number into some part of your material. Okay, so that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and, and, um, and one of the things that we're trying to do now, since we were able to, to show both with simulation and experiment that these um, super particles solely of CAD telluride or CAD selenide or gold or whatever can self-assemble into this much larger crystal structure, we're now trying to do that with these hybrid bionic particles as well. Um, so we can, we can try to amplify the effect that we observe with the single um, particles. Okay. Now, let's talk about how can we encode information into materials at the colloidal scale. So this idea was inspired by the work of, um, of Dave Pine and his group at the Center for Soft Matter Research at, at NYU. They make these cool particles. I think these are the first example of a reconfigurable colloidal building block. So what they did was they took um, uh, polystyrene or PMMA particles and they put a little dent in one and then they had a smaller particle whose radius of curvature matches the radius of curvature of the dent. Okay. And then they have depletants in the system. So depletants are small molecules. So these um, colloidal particles are say um, a micron across then the, the polymers might be about 50 nanometers radius of gyration. So if you have enough polymers in the solution, then they can act as depletants. So what happens is when the big colloidal particles come close together, it's entropically bad for the depletants, for the polymers to be in between them. So they go to the outside. That increases the osmotic pressure around the big particles and makes an effective attraction between these two particles that is so strong that once they come together, they don't come apart unless you lower the depletion concentration in the, in the system. And so that's what this um, graphic is, is trying to show here. And so they were able to do this. So they just throw in these, they call them Pac-Man particles. I don't really think they look like Pac-Man, but don't tell Dave Pond that. Um, uh, these, are the, these are these particles, and then these are the smaller ones. And so the, the, the Pac-Man particle is the, is the lock, and the little particle is like the key. So it's like a lock and key, shape-mediated, depletion-mediated binding. And, and they're able to put um, a number of different ones. So they can take two Pac-Man particles and put it on one lock, or, you know, two, two locks put on one key or, or more. They can make all these um, very interesting kinds of, um, of structures. And so we started getting interested to think, okay, so what could you do with those things? What would be the maximum number of locks that you could put around a given, given key? And so my students, Carolyn Phillips and Eric Jankowski, um, started looking into this and realized that this is, this is similar to the mathematics of the spherical codes. And so this is a picture of Isaac Newton, and that was Carolyn's apple on the head. Because Isaac Newton thought about things like, uh, like kissing number, which is how many particles you can fit around a central particle such that they, they, they just touch. Um, and so the solutions, the mathematical solutions of the ideal packing of, of spheres around a central sphere that minimizes the distance between any um, two spheres is called the spherical code. And so there is a, the, the spherical code is the solution, is the mathematical solution. There's a spherical code for two particles, for three particles, for four particles, for 12 particles, et cetera. Um, okay, so um, 
So we thought, well, but Dave and his students can change the, they can, they can change the size of the outer particles to the inner particles. So they can make the outer particles small enough that there's lots of room, or they can make them so big that it's hard to get them all on there. Um, and so we were thinking that if the outer spheres are not as, as, as large but not too small, then you could, once they come on with depletion interaction, they're stuck on there. They could rotate around. And so we think of that as an unlocked particle. So what if you could do something where you could lock and unlock these, these particles? Um, and so then, then we, we started thinking, because you know, we're theorists, we're simulators, so it's easy for us to propose all sorts of things to people who can actually make stuff. And we thought, well, you know, if you could, if you could actually label each one of these lock particles with a different color, say, um, then you could really encode information in this. So for example, if you could put four locks on one key, um, then you could, store, you could store one bit of information, right? So because there are two states. So if you have four particles, they form, with, they form basically a tetrahedron. And if each of the four spheres are a different color, then there's a, one's a chiral enantiomer or the other. So you can store these two states, one bit of information. And if you can put five particles and, and have them all be distinguishable, then you can store 30 states. And then pretty soon, you get up to some really large numbers of states, which we calculated to be about. You could basically have a terabyte in a, in a teaspoon, with a, in a tablespoon, with a very low concentration of colloids um, um, in water. So in principle, it's an immense potential to store information, especially at high density. Um, it's similar in spirit to the idea of using DNA for, um, for programmability and for, for information storage. Um, I don't know that it's practical necessarily, but it's a first step towards thinking about how we might both store information and carry out logical operations with colloids, which hasn't been done before. Um, but there's a lot that has to happen. We have to learn how to control this. We have to learn how to, how to read, write, manufacture these kinds of, of colloids. Um, and so let me show you what we've been able, what, what our colleagues at NYU have been able to achieve so far experimentally. It's, it's a really hard problem. So up here, this is a, a little confocal um, movie showing Chasm, um, Dave's former um, postdoc, putting the, the different locks around a key particle just to try to speed things up. So he's using optical tweezers from Dave Greer's lab, and he's pulling these, these he's trapping these in, in, in these optical tweezers, he's trapping a lock and dragging it over to the key. So now he's self-assembled four particles around one particle here, okay? And, but it's, it's on a surface, so he sequestered it on a surface just so he could, he could make it. Then he releases it from the surface, and that's the experimental movie that we're seeing down in the lower left corner. And you see that there's these four lobes and they're organized um, in, in, they have a certain conformation, and if you watch them, let me see if I can start this one again. There. So this is a simulation of the same radii of spheres trying to show what's happening in the experiment. And we can see that this thing is going through, it, it, it undergoes a structural transition from one enantiomer to another. Now, in this image here, so this is showing one structural um, state, this is showing the other structural state, um, and this is showing the in-between state, in between the, 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 the two states. Um, but these are colored after the fact, right? So in principle, this is not yet a colloidal bit. This cannot store two different states, because if you, if you look at it and then you turn away and you look back, you don't know which, which particles were which, right? So they're not distinguishable. Um, and so that's the next step, is to try to do that. So possibly this is not something that's, that's scalable, but it's the first demonstration that you could actually do this um, and that you could um, try to, so, so I mentioned one of the challenges would be to say, deswell the particle in the middle to lock the particles on the outside together. So then you can lock in the information. So if you could do that, even without doing too much storage, you could imagine, or too much computing with it, you could imagine using them as tagants. 
in materials, right? So you could encode some information if you could lock, say, seven different particles in a certain code. Um, you might have a million possible states. You can encode that in and throw them into some kind of material and, and, uh, and then be able to tag the material. Okay, so the last example I want to show is um, about how we might achieve hierarchical, hierarchical compartmentalization for in colloidal materials. So this is work um, done by um, uh, Nguyen Nguyen, Daphne Kotze, and Michael Engel, who are, who are here, just published earlier last year. Um, and what, you, what it looks like you're seeing is um, a binary mixture, two, two types of particles, where yellow likes yellow, and blue likes blue, and yellow doesn't like blue. And this looks to be pretty high density in here, because it looks like it's forming um, a little crystal. Just do that again. So it looks like it's phase separating. <clears throat> and then you're getting these kinds of these patterns. And the picture on the right is just showing you the, um, the, um, the motion of the particles at the interface is faster than the motion of the particles on the inside. Um, but interestingly, what, what this really is, is a mixture of hard particles that um, are little gears. And they're being rotated, the blue ones in one direction and the yellow ones in another direction. And simply because um, of steric interactions, they collide. And so if two um, like ones, like rotating particles come together, they can get stuck on one another, and that gives a little effective, attractive interaction between them. There's no explicit interaction. It's an effective attraction. And when two particles that are rotating in opposite directions come together, they don't stick with each other. So it's, it's like the, an effective repulsion between the particles. So it's an emergent phenomena. It only happens when you're rotating. It's, it's only something that's characteristic of a system driven far from, from, um, from equilibrium. As soon as you turn off the driving force, all the interesting behavior goes away. Um, one of the things you could do is you could imagine throwing in inert little particles. They'll go right to the interface where the, um, where the flow is the fastest. And then you can use, imagine exploiting this compartmentalization uh, for transport. So what um, Matthew Spellings here has been doing it, and with Michael Engel is thinking about what happens if we can sequester these. Can we build little um, colloidal cells from these kind of rotating gear particles? Um, and so here's an example where um, you take these left and right-handed uh, you know, driven rotating particles and you put them inside, a, uh, inside of a boundary where the particles are rotating in similar directions to the ones on the inside. The only difference between these two is the size. And here are some, some little movies that show you what happened. So, so we saw before that these things, the, 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 the like rotating ones have an, attract, have an effective attraction, and, the, and, and dislike ones have an effective repulsion. Um, but look at these interesting kinds of patterns that emerge, and this interesting kind of oscillating behavior that you get, um, all of this in, in systems that are driven far from equilibrium. So one of the things that you could look at is what happens if you, if you, um, if you change the interior stoichiometry of the different kinds of particles or the boundary stoichiometry, um, which can control the kinds of compartmentalization that you get inside by controlling the rotation rate, for example. Here's what happens if you, um, if you make a boundary where you have not just two types of particles, like a Janus boundary, but you have multiple different um, types. And then if you switch, so we just had six different ones, like three yellows, three blues. Now we have two yellows, two blues. Now we switch to five yellows, five blues. So imagine that you had an, a mixture of these particles on the inside, and you don't change anything about them. It's half are rotating one way, half are rotating the other way. And then you have a boundary where it's programmable. And you can imagine switching which ones are spinning rightward and which ones are spinning leftward. And you could change that pattern on the outside. Then all of a sudden you could imagine changing the shape of an object that's encapsulate, that, that this thing is encapsulating. Then you can imagine what happens if you put them together into these collectives. Um, and so here's an example of these, these sort of Janus colloidal cells that are all um, pushed together enough so that they can interact. 
and you see this really interesting behavior that, of course, at short times and, late, and long times, it, the motion has to be diffusive, but you get this interesting super diffusive motion as these particles kind of, these particles, these cells start to, are, are kind of squirting in between um, each other. So these are things that we're, we're working with um, several different groups to try to actually make these kinds of, of things. Um, so far, we've been successful in, in showing some of the, um, demonstrating some of the behavior in 3D printed pucks on an air hockey table. But the idea is to actually make them out of colloids. Um, so, for example, one of the things that we, we like to do is we're working with Paul Chaikin um, at NYU and Sam Stoop um, at, uh, at Northwestern University under an in, uh, EFRC sponsored by, by DOE, the Center for Bio-Inspired uh, Bio -inspired Energy Science, to take these, these amazing polymer um, vesicles that Sam Stoop makes and then using some um, colloidal particles that uh, that Paul Chaikin makes where you have two particles stuck together in a dumbbell. You put a hematite cube on one end um, and catalyze a, a, a reaction that self-propels the particle, spins it around, and the idea is to try to encapsulate it and make something that if we can bias the interactions in some way, that maybe we can create a little crawling little sack. Okay? So this is, you know, we're just getting started to try to figure out how to do these things. Um, so I want to mention a couple things. So this is, uh, this is work from um, Michael Brenner's group. I just wanted to highlight this from yesterday's session because this idea of self-replicating colloids um, is something that really has captured the, the minds of a lot of different, uh, a lot of physicists now, is thinking about how you can self-assemble a colloidal structure in a bath of building blocks that make up the original colloidal structure and have it build more and then have each of them build more and each of them build more so that you can get exponential growth of your colloidal particles. And, uh, and, and uh, Michael was able to publish this uh, nice paper where they showed that um, they were able to do this with, with octahedra. They self-assembled different kinds of particles in the octahedra in a computer simulation, what their simulation showed them is that they had to have flexibility in the interactions. So I'm like, I, I don't have time to take you through all of this, um, but, but the idea was that, that if, you're, if your interactions are rigid, then you can't self-replicate. You have to have some flexibility in the bonding between these different particles in order to get self-replication. Um, I mentioned Paul Chaikin before. He's working with Ned Seaman um, at, uh, at NYU. And they're looking at using DNA and DNA-linked colloids to get, to, to get self-replication and try to get exponential growth by turning on and turning off uh, light. And they've even now demonstrated for the first time evolutionary selection in, um, in uh, the production of these little DNA um, tiles by biasing, oops, sorry, by biasing towards um, towards the preference for different sorts of structures. So this is the kind of things that was talked about in this, in this session um, yesterday, and so there's more talks this week on, on these kinds of topics. So um, I just want to mention that we're actually trying, um, as I mentioned with the, with the cells, but with all of this stuff, we're trying to actually use theory modeling simulation to guide the fabrication of these kinds of materials um, in, um, as part of, a, of this uh, DOE project. Um, working also with Kyle Bishop at Penn State um, and, uh, and Emily Weiss, Chad Merkin, um, I mentioned Paul Chaikin and George Whitesides and Monica Vera Dela Cruz. We're trying to build up the, the kind of first generation of active colloidal machines to try to phys just figure out, you know, what is the physics that's going on? How can we understand how to control the, the interactions? Um, how does... Um, uh, you know, how, how can we transduce energy? How is energy dissipation working? What is, what is um, going on in the system? There's many, many questions to be, to be asked with these very simple types of models, and then hopefully with these first instantiations of these, of these materials. So I'll, I'll stop now and simply acknowledge um, the funding agencies that support this work, and thank you all for spending your Wednesday evening here.